studio director in Sydney in DWP. I've been with the practice um, around seven years. Um, I'm design oriented architect. Um, I worked in residential heritage, um, commercial, civic, um, and in the last three or four years, I'm focusing on sport architecture. Um, I'm also leading design council within the company. Um, so every project is going through design process that is very rigorous. So we make sure that um, we have the best outcome for every single project. Um, and then with this um, project, we were engaged by um, Cumberland City Council. Um, we were preferred tenderer for the project. We did another project with this council uh, prior to this one, which is the Granville Centre, which is vaccination hub at the moment. <laughs> and um, I, before going any further, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country, which will live and work throughout Australia. And in relation to this project, um, I would like to acknowledge the land of the Darug people. Um, so with this project, um, sustainability was a um, very important objective um, and the timber construction was actually key in achieving um, this. And the goal was to demonstrate that this size of the building um, uh, can be highly sustainable, that is low carbon, low waste, and highly energy efficient. And um, we're over to yourself now, Nick, if you could just start with an introduction about yourself, then also maybe we're going to speak a little bit about the, the structural system uh, for the project and, you know, some of the more challenging aspects of it. Sure. Um, yeah, so I, um, I'm a structural engineer at Northrop um, Consulting Engineers. We have offices sort of all up and down the eastern seaboard of Australia, but I'm based in Sydney, in the Sydney office. Um, I've been there since uh, toward the end of 2012, so coming up on about 10 years now. Um, I'll lead a sort of team of around eight engineers, um, one of whom uh, has since, I guess, left us um, and moved to moved up to the Northern Territory to become a teacher. She was actually the one that did most of the design on this project. Um, you know, I was involved as a sort of project verifier, um, sort of a QA checker. And, um, and yeah, when, when she left to go up there, I kind of um, took over the job and sort of saw, saw it through to completion. Um, so, yeah, I guess we, we were involved in this project since the very beginning, um, not only for structure, but we did pretty much every discipline, I think. Um, you know, mechanical, electrical, hydraulic, civil, some of the ones that I didn't even know we did. Um, traffic, you know, just some of the smaller niche um, uh, services. But yeah, I was I was pretty much entirely involved in the um, in the structural component of it, um, and particularly the timber um, aspect of it, which is obviously you know, what we're talking about in this presentation. Um, I guess you know the, the challenge of this project from the very beginning is. You know, once you look at it, you can tell what it is. It's a huge cantilever that goes out front. Um, that's not really a thing that's typically done in timber. You know, looking at these sort of large cantilevers, um, big long spans, you know, the first sort of thing that would definitely come to mind is steel. And that's probably, you know, the first the first couple of options that we looked at was to do this, was to do this structure in steel, um, you know. But, and then architect win that. <laughs> <laughs> Architects won that war. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, we've since made quite a lot of um, sort of sustainability and climate commitments as, a, as an organisation. So, you know, we're aiming to have all our projects be carbon neutral by twenty um, by twenty thirty. But you know, this came about before I think we made those sort of commitments. So Ivana sort of. You know, was pushing us in the right direction. Um, fortunately, at the time, we already had some experience um, in timber building, but we'd done um, a peer review for the International House building in, in Sydney, which was Sydney's first sort of mass timber building. Um, and we'd 
more or less completed the design of another one in Melbourne and another one in Newcastle. So we'd had a couple of runs on the board and we were familiar with the material, what it could and couldn't do. Um, so yeah, the, the really the key challenge was, was just trying to get some of the cantilevers up. Everything else was um, from a timber sense, you know, uh, nothing particularly un unusual. The, the main spans are large, but you know, the, the solution is simple, just make the beams larger. Um, so yeah, yeah, dealing with a lot of that stuff early on was was interesting. And then and then moving into um, sort of having the design carried out by a contractor, um, you know, the, the supplier of the project, Rubner, they they did the detailed design once it sort of went past tender. Um, that was probably the newest thing for us actually was how to how to inf interface with them um and and yeah just communicating some of the australian standards across them and how all that worked was a bit different because on our past jobs we just did you know all the design um ourselves so so that was an interesting challenge perhaps a little bit unexpected i suppose was was yeah how to, how to um, navigate with them fortunately you know they were great um, very professional and, and their documentation was really good. So, so it was, um, yeah, all smooth sailing. I can't wish there were more challenges really to talk about <laughs> structurally anyway. I'm sure there's plenty. No doubt. Well, there's yeah, plenty of challenges and for yourself, Ivana, at the very beginning of the project, was there, was it important to get the whole team on board for, for Timbar and was there any, um, was at any stage at, you know, more easy to just go with steel or was it timber and non-negotiable from the start for you? Um, for me, it was non-negotiable because I wanted something special. I didn't want another grandstand in the suburbs that looks the same as any other uh, made in steel. So with Northrop, that, as Nick said, they were doing all the services, but part of that did acoustics, traffic engineer, and so on. So really, um, all almost all engineers on the project were from Northrop. We had first site visit when um, the existing small facility was about to be demolished, uh, just to look at the field um, and the area where the new facility will be. And then I said to um, two structural engineers that I'm thinking about timber and the answer was timber <laughs> so, um, and they would say yeah sure um, so um, the client was really looking for highly sustainable facility um, and that was one of the reasons I wanted um, to go with Simba, but the other reason, as I said, I just wanted something that is different, um, um, that is iconic, and that will be um, memorable for the community where it was built. So um, I, I had great support um, from the client, from Cumberland City Council. Their manager uh, really supported that idea, and um, all the way through the project. So uh, with the first tender, uh, the project came back um, way over budget. And of course, the first thing they looked at was, oh, let's change this timber into steel. And I so didn't want to do that. And I talked to the client and I was like, okay, just find a solution. So at that time, a uh, structural engineer from Northrop, um, Rebecca, that uh, Nick mentioned, she was in Italy and visiting Rubina, the manufacturer. And she called me and said, do you mind if I show your drawings? And they are happy to give you an estimate without any obligations. I was like, yeah, sure. So they came back um, with the million saving. So um, that was amazing. Um, client um, accepted. Uh, we just retended with um, Rubna as preferred supplier um, or the supplier that the builder should go with. Um, and yeah, that's how we got a timber there. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's so good. And obviously another one of the uh, aspects of it, it seems like it'd be really hard to build this thing. Uh, Nick, were you part of the installation um, team or were you part of those conversations as well? And Ivana, were you part of these? Because that, that um, yeah, the double cantilevers and whatnot, it's uh, yeah, really, really difficult. 
Yeah. Um, so there's installers with Savcon, who um, you know probably one of, if not the leading installer um, for mass timber in in Australia. Um, so they, to be honest, had it pretty well under control. Um, you know, there there is complexity with those large cam levers, and I think they had um, another engineer looking at the looking at the temporary stability stuff as well. Um, so the only you know. For the majority of the structure, it's, it's more or less simply supported beams between between columns, and and you sort of you know put some props up and, and away you go. But there was a bit of um, there was a bit of a challenging thought as to how we would actually install each one of those cantilevered V's sort of individually, um, not have it sort of tip over because obviously if it's if it's off at an angle, it's going to try and twist over. Um, so fortunately, I guess there was quite a lot of capacity in, in the timber. I mean, you look at these timber columns and they're not really small, you know, they're, they're sort of, uh, I can't remember the exact dimension of them, 240 by 360 or something like that. They're, they're, they're pretty, they're pretty sizable. So there was enough capacity in them to sort of hold the whole thing together. Um, our original idea was obviously the simplest one and put a prop at the end of it, um, you know, temporarily prop it and, and you don't have this problem anymore. Um, that was rejected pretty quickly by by Belmadar being a grandstand. I think the oh, Belmadar's the builder, by the way. Um, being a grandstand, it's I think about three meters at the top of the grandstand from column height. At the end of the cantilever, it's something six meters, just to just to get this big prop up there, and and you know would be fairly challenging to install. So so yeah, that that idea of um, of sort of the unbalanced cantilever and, and just you know in some ways doing it more simply without propping was was yeah seen through an engineering um as we sort of work through the plan about actually build it but other than that you know the the whole principle behind um this sort of modern mass timber is to is to almost treat it like steel work which i think is quite you know simple and well understood by everyone um in Australia and, and take it away from a more conventional sort of carpentry approach um, where, you know, instead of using screws and nails and, and inter, uh, joinery and all that kind of stuff, um, you know, it, it's basically just bolting everything together once it actually arrives on site. Um, and a lot of that work, I guess, into um, sequencing and, ways to sort of cleverly hide bolts. Um, that was done by the Rubin team. Um, you know, we sort of worked with them on on how to how to how to do that so that it, when you actually get to site it's just straightforward, you bolt it together. Um, and off you go. What were the sizes of the members? I mean for uh Rubina delivering it in shipping containers and did you have like moment connections and whatnot to or pretty heavy connections to make it, you know, back into one piece, so to speak. Yeah, there were splices in the main, um, in the main beams, and and that was due to, you know, the the main beams that weren't part of the the cantilever, so the ones that were part of the backspan, they had a splice in the middle of them just to just to try and keep um, keep sizes down to around I think twelve meters was was probably the biggest one. Um, for yeah, for obvious reasons, I guess it, it's coming in from overseas and it needs to fit in a container. Um, the splices, yeah, they're pretty big members. I think they're around twelve hundred deep by uh, two forty wide. Like they're they're pretty sizable beams. Um, the splices that were actually used um, were pretty neat. You know, they're they're in sort of the low stress region, so they weren't you know there wasn't too much going on in them. There's just quite a lot of dowels. You know, that, that, that would have been installed in the factory in in Italy. Um, really, yeah, that that's just to try and keep that cost down. And as Ivana mentioned, you know, cost was a big was a big factor here. Um, you know, there wasn't a whole bunch of spare money to spend on uh, top shipping containers and and so on. I've been told by the by the people in Rubna that they I think the biggest they've done is a forty meter beam that they've shipped. Um, you know, all the way from Italy in one piece. So it's definitely possible. Like anything's possible. You could probably ship the whole thing, the whole building over in one piece if you really 
who really had the money to. But yeah, keeping yeah, it at think... twelve meters was 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 a good um was a good thing that, that yeah Rubino just you know sort of instinctively worked into their into their plan. Yeah, the the timber for this job came. I think three shipments um, in each had four containers, and um, the good thing it's it's like Lego. You know, every yeah. single element is labeled, and how it comes out, that's how it's um, pulled up in that order. So it's very simple and quick. But for me, like the, the frustrating part of the job um, was just to make sure that shop drawings are hundred percent because if it's not <laughs> we're stopped we can't change it on site and it was hundred percent so that was all good yeah well that's an interesting one so um, traditionally you could just sort of take things a bit later for this how how did you i mean manage that to make sure that everything was fully worked out before uh before things elements came on a ship um ship yeah we had uh, we had this process going on for six weeks. Um, it was back and forth between Northrop, um, Rubna and myself. So they would send their model. Then I would insert that um, overlay with architectural model, um, see where the bracing or anything is sticking out of facade, <laughs> freak out, and then, um, make changes. Um, and um, Engineers from Rubina were very accommodating. They they just kept um, the design intent, didn't want to change um, what we originally designed and um, work through changing the, the members and elements to, to fit within a walls or wherever um, it was required. There were a few things um, um, that was with, like bracing over the a lift um, overrun um, that was quite tight, but we made it work um, and so on. So, um, but yeah, there were there were a lot of back and forth. Yeah, I think working in three D is you know almost an essential nowadays. Everyone does it, um, and it's yeah, it's probably the only way that we can really get that sort of um, accuracy for these exposed structural elements in the sort of time frames that we're looking at. Mm. Yeah. Was it, Nick, you were saying it was interesting work with the room, your engineers. What about the modeling part as well? Do you, uh, was there a bit of a, was there any issues in um, defining this s scope or did everything go pretty smoothly or was there little scope gaps um, in the process? Yeah, I guess, you know, we ended up um, certifying the project um, being being a sort of local engineer, so at the end of the day, you know, from from a design and analysis point of view, the buck kind of stopped with us. Right? Like like we had to be certain that we we're happy with with everything, and that you know we were cap we were happy that all the loads were kept and so on. Um, I suppose you know it, it is a bit tricky from a certification point of view. Um, the fact that can't really design one of these buildings to the Australian standards. Um, there are just slightly too many holes in the Australian standards and not enough sort of, you know, um, or exits out of the code where you can feasibly do some, even simple things like a screw that's bigger than, I think, seven millimetres in diameter is not covered by the Australian code. Smooth dowels aren't covered by the Australian code. You know, there was enough places where we had to we had to go into the euro code um, or you know Rubna basically had no real um, understanding or background with the Australian code because it, you know no reason to use it before really um, and trying to trying to sort of reconcile Australian loading with um, with European design um, codes was a bit um, you know, it, was, it was interesting a bit, a bit tricky but essentially like you know, if, if you can prove um, some degree of, of, I guess, similarity between the Australian and, and European codes, which you know, they're essentially the same, um, then, then yeah, play on, I suppose. But, but that was, yeah, that was a, that's probably the most challenging part about working with um, 
with the you know, overseas manufacturer that, that is doing the design as well. It's, it's just trying to trying to you know not miss the things that are sort of lost in translation between codes. Um, but yeah, they've, they've certainly you know designed things that are the, even you know wilder and you know more ambitious in. In, in Europe, you know, some pretty crazy stuff and, and you know, it would be, it would be remiss of us to, I guess, to say that the Australian standard is better, you know, is, is, <laughs> is, is more appropriate and is safer and so on. So. One day, maybe one of the, one of the features is, is the glue lamb in, you know, the external of the building. So uh, some understanding of durability and, and how it uh, works with the weather is uh, is important. So, um, you know, I guess you both would have had a good look at this. So maybe start with yourself, Ivana. Um, in from yeah, we have um, yeah. Uh, so the the timber structure is fully covered. So we have a roof with metal sheeting. We have fascia around the um, edge beams. So it is covered. Um, the other thing the columns are not sitting on concrete slab um, they are sitting on um, steel um, and which is like 200 300 off of the concrete slab so um, there is that separation as well and um, they did the coating within a factory um, and uh, this timber is pretty durable so i think they need to recode like every three to five years um and other than that you don't need to do anything else really the um deliberate sort of decision made and designed to you know do the do the obvious things keep water off off the timber um and once once we can achieve that you know just um just well, once you're sort of keeping that moisture content of the timber down then you know there's not really any um yeah you, i think you're pretty safe there and, and there's definitely precedent in in um sydney to have these sort of softwoods be be exposed to weather but just you know keeping behind direct wetting and drying that's it you know whenever you're not covering the timber up with plasterboard or something you can always you letting it breathe and if there was some moisture getting in somewhere and it's all visual as well yeah, so yeah. sort of led to one of the you know, challenges actually on the project was they're protected by these big cantilevers but at the corners there are these double cantilevers which are actually quite quite tricky um so yeah i, I think you know that's just something to consider that it, it was structurally, I suppose, not ideal to have these big cantilevers, but in the end, it's better to do a bit of structural gymnastics early on and protect the timber um, than to than to you know leave the timber exposed or I suppose use a, use some form of hardwood. So it's uh we're getting towards the end of the podcast now. So I might just ask an open-ended question of you both. Start with yourself, Ivana, on what were I guess what were the, the the key items for this project success or a different way of phrasing what were the and also what were the lessons learned for this project you um you'll take on for, for future projects um well um it, it it's not hard to to work with timber um that was uh, this is my first timber project and um i went into it really not knowing um, what to expect but going through the process with the right engineer I think um, was really helpful and um, I'm very proud of this project because it is the first um, timber facility um, of this type in Australia like the sport facility that is um, timber um, and um, I would recommend timber um, from now on and that's what I'm doing currently with other projects in my company, uh, really trying to introduce glue lamb, CLT, because it, it, it's a great product. It, it just um, gives that um, 
um, glow to the interior, to the exterior. Um, it's warm um, and connects to nature, which is really what we need to do. And sorry, I'm in dark because I'm in a <laughs> sustainable building uh, and because I'm not moving, <laughs> the, the lights are off. <laughs> I noticed that as Nick was speaking, I saw you just trying to move in the background, trying to get those sensors going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's good. Well, uh, yeah, that's great. There's so much in that. And, and yourself, Nick? Um, I think this one, you know, it's, to me, it's just don't be a purist with timber. You know, I think we hear on this podcast, you know, being hosted by, you know, people who live and breathe timber. But from a design point of view, I think there's still, um, when, you, when you're looking at stuff that's this ambitious, there's still a lot to learn from um, steel and concrete methodologies and building things. And, you know, when we talk about the, how we achieve the connections, you know, our first pass was a purist attempt it's like how do you build this thing with the most timber possible and while that was great um it just wasn't really the right answer for this for this thing the, the right answer was to almost turn the timber beams into a steel beam right like you you almost have a steel beam and you just cut the middle out of it and place them with timber right? and to use more of that steel erection methodology which which ended up being you know quite successful um, and similarly, you know, it's, it's it's not necessarily the right solution for everything. Like there, there was um, there was quite a lot of beauty in this structure, in my opinion, um, in sort of setting off the the um, the timber with that you know sort of concrete base and how sort of you know thin and elegant some 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 of the corners of the concrete were. I think you know it's important to to yeah, keep that in mind and and you know use the timber where it really counts and where and where you can. Where you can show it off the most um, because at the end of the day it is an expensive um, material in some instances and that was something that, that you know nearly got us on this job and to use it effectively meant that we were using more timber um, in a much more effective way than none at all right um, so it's yeah it's it's like you guys said it's not you know it's not rocket science um, just yeah it's a good one to, to add to your arsenal really